impulse to kill, to maim. Outbursts of pure, senseless violence that shake us to the core. Will we ever find the key to unlock and repair the violent mind? Now, scientists are getting glimpses into that dark and dangerous territory, analyzing the Molotov cocktail of brain and body, and asking, how much is violence a part of our very nature? Are some of us just born bad? What goes on inside the mind of a violent criminal? Is society to blame, or is it genetics? For most of this century, the argument has raged. Society has taken a lot of the blame. Bad behavior comes from bad treatment, bad upbringing, bad luck. But now scientists are exploring the biology of behavior. New technologies are opening windows into the mysteries of the human mind. Through research, we are gaining glimpses of what causes impulsive outbursts. Though far from solving the whole puzzle, we are learning to recognize the individual entities and their risk factors. Where does the biological recipe of risk begin? Just being born male is the first. 89% of violent offenders in U.S. jails are men. The temptation to link violence with gender is strong. But so far, surprisingly, science has found little evidence. Instead, the search for understanding has turned the spotlight into the inner workings of our brain. Jason is just six years old. He is a warm and loving child and a backyard basketball hero. He also has a problem with his behavior. At three and a half years old, Jason was diagnosed as having Attention Deficit Disorder, or ADD. At the heart of Jason's problem is his inability to pay attention. While most kids have short attention spans, ADD children experience extreme difficulties in sustaining their concentration in focus and impulsivity. It is a problem he shares with nearly 10% of all children. This shit is kind of funny. The Tova, or t of aggression towards his friends. Um, if something doesn't go his way, he hits. Why well, don't I get to you stay high? Research suggests that okay. between 25 and 70 percent of children with attention deficit yeah. disorder and hyperactivity will continue to experience the condition as adults. Jason, that is I when ADD causes serious trouble. Part of Jason's condition, hyperactivity has been linked to low arousal, a physical state of alertness lower than normal. Dr. Rain's theory is that low physical arousal predicts for an aggressive personality. He is matching the test results of volunteers with their history of aggression, just to feel normal. If you have individuals with low levels of arousal below normal levels, what these people do here is they seek out stimulation to increase their arousal levels back to normal. Low heart rate is an index of fearlessness. For example, bomb disposal experts in the army have low heart rate levels. They are particularly fearless, cool individuals. Autonomically, they are not aroused by threatening events. Now, for some kids, one way of getting that arousal jag in life is by burglaring a house, beating someone up, robbing a store. We do not know what causes low arousal. It could be genetic or environmental. Low arousal also has its uses providing nerves of steel for success in sports or business. But the dark side of low arousal can drive people to savage acts of violence, a serious risk factor. So how does low arousal translate into crime statistics? How many of the hearts here beat at a slower rate? I would sus suspect it's not trivial. I would make a guess that perhaps 30, 35% of all prisoners suffer from chronically low physiological arousal. At Darrington State Penitentiary in Texas, psychologist Dr. Ernst Barat wrestles with another part of the puzzle. 
he works with a group of prisoners known as the Bad Boys, the ones so violent that they are separated from the main prison population. Dr. Barat is most interested in prisoners with a mean temper, the ones that lash out. In Barat's terms, prisoners who are impulsively aggressive. Floyd Lobby. Okay, now I'm going to make, make another design. In earlier neuropsychological tests, yeah. Dr. Barat found that the visual skills of impulse prisoners were good, but their verbal expression was poor. Floyd scored badly for verbal self-expression. Okay. As a group, the impulsive aggressive prisoners showed problems with reading and expressing themselves with words. The PZ electrode measures the activity in the parietal lobe, one part of our brain that deals with visual information. Here, Floyd's wave pattern shows a marked difference to the other groups in the study, but it is exactly the same as the patterns found in all other impulsive inmates. If the parietal lobe is not working as well as it should, the brain may have difficulty recognizing letters and words. In Dr. Barat's view, the ability to read and express thoughts and words has a strong influence on the ability to control a violent temper. This image is the brain of a man who committed murder in one act of impulsive violence. What you see there at the top of the skull is a distinct lack of prefrontal functioning. It's the foremost part of the brain. It's involved in the ability to plan, control, and regulate behavior. In a way, it's a bit like the emergency brake on the brain. Damage the prefrontal cortex and you lose the inhibitory control of the prefrontal cortex on deeper brain structures like the amygdala and hypothalamus, which we know from animal studies, are involved in the initiation and generation of aggressive feelings and behavior. Scientists are beginning to sort through the incredibly complex tangle of chemical reactions. And they are looking most closely at the brain's chemical messengers the neurotransmitters. There's one that is looking particularly suspicious when it comes to violence. It is called serotonin. Energetic? About uh, zero. Zero. Terrible. Anxious? Psychiatrist Dr. Emil Kakaro is gathering information from volunteers on normal Drowning. levels of serotonin. At the Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute, Dr. Kakaro takes blood samples from the volunteers so he can match them against personality profiles. What we think is happening is that when you have low serotonin, you have a decreased threshold for responding to provocating stimuli. So if somebody were to say something insulting to another person and that person's serotonin level would be low, they would be more likely to respond to that or over respond to that stimulus than somebody who uh, had good serotonin function. And if low levels of a brain chemical can influence our behavior, what happens when we add other chemicals like alcohol or drugs? Alcohol is a depressant drug. It depresses the central nervous system. That's important for us to understand. Most of the time, we're pretty efficient in terms of my perception of you, my behavior towards you, but when I drink, the efficiency of my brain changes. The amounts and timing are calculated to put volunteers at a precise level of drunkenness before they play the game. But the penalties in this game are electric shocks, and Scott believes he is competing against an opponent in another room. If his reactions are fast enough, he can give his opponent an electric shock. Too slow, and he gets the shock. Research assistant Michael Halsizer measures how far Scott will go. How high he sets the shock levels for his partner. How aggressive he is under the influence of alcohol. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, come on. What'll happen is the subject will behave more disinhibited way. And what we found, therefore, since they're not as concerned about receiving shock or getting hurt, and they're not as concerned about your receiving pain, they tend to behave more disinhibited. They set higher shocks for the other person. Dr. Taylor calls alcohol a sloppy drug because it has a blanket effect on the entire brain, rather than just part of it. 
He's also tested the effects of other sorts of depressants, minor tranquilizers like Valium, and found similar results. We tend to think that when the nervous system is stimulated, when it's made aroused, that's when we become aggressive. But what we're finding is that when you depress the central nervous system with morphine, with alcohol, with what we call benzodiazepines, which are minor tranquilizers, we find that when you do that, aggression increases. In Stuart Taylor's view, taking a drink or a drug to calm yourself down is like using fuel to put out a fire. So can it be said that a violent offender is born bad? Scientists say no. There is no single gene that codes for violent behavior. And even though we can inherit risky biology, it does not mean it is going to amount to anything, just as we can be prone to cancer, yet remain disease-free. Crucial to the equation is environment. While our genes give us the gun, is it what's going on around us that pulls the trigger? What becomes clear is that both are involved. Some of the twin studies that we've done indicate that maybe 30 to 40 percent, maybe even a little more, is genetic, and the rest is environmental. Looking for an answer in biology or genetics alone will not do the trick. It is not as simple as just fixing up the bad bits. As well, there is danger in being too quick to point the finger. Aggressive behavior does not mean a person is all bad. Albert Einstein, one of the world's greatest scientists, had a reputation for violent outbursts as a child.